We're delighted that you're watching this online service as we celebrate our 20th birthday throughout September. This service will be broadcasted on social media and we'd appreciate if you could share it to help spread hope. As from Wednesday the 16th of September, we're presenting an online wealth series to discover God's blueprints for abundance. Sign up by sending wealth series to 079-520-2088. Join one of our life groups this term and let's grow together. Online Zoom options available. Partner with Operation Hope by donating non-perishable food at our office to help those in need. Catch this week's City Kids video episode on our Facebook page. Thank you for remaining faithful with your financial contributions. May this message fill your heart with hope. want to pick it up in verse 5 where David writes he says you anoint my head with oil my cup overflows surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life surely David says goodness and mercy shall follow all the days of my life and I remember meeting a pastor in in Pretoria and one of the township and his his name was Pastor Titus he was an incredible man of God he built a phenomenal church and built a couple of hospitals and orphanages um, all with money that he raised in the township. Incredible man of God. And, and Pastor Titus had three daughters. And the eldest he called Shirley. And the second daughter he called Mercy. And the third daughter he called Goodness. Because he said, Shirley, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You see, he had a revelation that God made a covenant with him of abundance. And that's the next covenant that, that we want to cover in Psalm 23. It's a covenant of abundance. David writes and he says, You anoint my head, my cup overflows. It runs over. It's not just enough for me to drink, but you want to anoint me to the point where I overflow. Now what's the difference between provision and abundance? You see, because in the, in, in the beginning of the psalm, David says, I will have no needs. In other words, you provide. Remember, we covered a covenant of provision. But there's a difference between abundance and provision. Provision means I have enough to eat today. That's provision. And God says, I will always provide for you all your needs. But I want to take you to the next level. After you've discovered my purpose, after you've uh, discovered victory in the valley, I want to anoint your head, not only for provision, but for abundance to run over. Why? Because God not only wants to bless me, he wants to convert you and I into a blessing for others. You're running over. When a cup runs over, people sitting around about you will, will find the provision of God through your life. And so I'm so excited about this covenant of abundance. God wants to bless you and I until we become a blessing. Because that's really heaven's culture. Have you ever thought of this, that heaven has a culture of abundance? There's no lack in heaven. There's no lack in heaven. Heaven has enough resources. Heaven has enough love. Heaven has enough peace. Heaven has enough strength and energy. But heaven also have, has enough money or resources. Have you ever thought that, that heaven's streets are paved with gold? And so they tell the story about this rich man who arrived in heaven with a bag of gold, full of gold bars. And St. Peter met him at the gate and said, the pearly gate, and he says, my friend, what are you bringing to heaven? He said, no, I've got all these bags of gold that I want to just deposit in your bank. And Peter looked into it. He said, oh, you brought us paving stones. You see, heaven has no shortage. The Bible talks about the sea in the heaven or the waters in heaven being seas of crystal and diamonds. Our greatest treasure in heaven or on earth is paving in heaven. Because the earth is really the Lord's, isn't it? And the fullness thereof. The Bible states that a cattle, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. All the gold, all the silver, all the resources ultimately belongs to him. Have you ever thought of all the gold, for instance, that's available on earth? Will never leave earth. And so it just passes hands from one generation to another. But, but nobody can take the, the gold off the earth to the next life. It stays here. And so we are but custodians, but it belongs to God. And so our Father, our God, has a culture of abundance. He will never have lack. 
And He calls you and I, this is the good news, to become expressions of His abundance on earth. We've got this prayer. Jesus taught us to pray. As it is in heaven, so be it on earth. And so if heaven has a culture of abundance, then it's fair for us to pray. Father, let your superabundance that is in heaven manifest in my life on earth so that I can become a blessing to other people. If we look at the lives of Abram, Isaac, Jacob, even Joseph, we see superabundance in them. They became expressions of heaven's culture. You know, Abram was so rich that the rich people called him rich. You know, when we grew up, we were so poor that the poor people called us poor. Then you yes, Aram. If the poor people says, ach, shame, then you know you're Aram. But Abram was so rich, and, and his son Isaac, the Bible says he planted in the midst of famine, and he became so rich, he became the envy of the Philistine. And that's God's heart for his children, that we again will become the envy of the Philistines, that they will look at us and say, wow, God has blessed you. And so the Jewish people, if you look at them, God has really called the Jewish nation to be a blessing to all nations. And that's why the Jews are blessed. They are wealthy. I, I don't always think that they share that wealth with the rest of the world. And maybe that's why there's a lot of fighting with the Jews. But God has called them to be a blessing to all. He's also called us as believers who, are in a, who live in a new covenant with God to be expressions of His blessing to others. And so think about this, that your, your head is anointed to overflow. Your head is anointed for abundance. He anoints my head. My cup runs over. You carry an anointing as a believer to overflow with the blessings of God, with the goodness of God in your life. You see, the problem is many times we don't think like that. We don't think that God has anointed us to overflow. We think we only need enough to survive yet another day or another week or another month. We think thoughts of scarcity and we think thoughts of poverty but the shepherd says, may I anoint your head to overflow? May I anoint your head to think thoughts of abundance, to think like heaven thinks, to think according to the culture of heaven. God said to Abram this, he said, Abram, I, I want to bless you until all the nations are blessed on your account. Until in your seed, all the nations will be blessed. Now, who's the seed of Abram? Galatians 3 tells us, that we who believe are children of Abram. So in whose seed, and who will all the nations be blessed? In us. If not by us, then by who? God has called us to become such a blessing. But I believe we, we, are not, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to anoint our heads to think differently. I love the story of William Colgate. He arrived in New York on a ship from England and uh, he found a job in a soap factory and there was a gentleman that led him to the Lord, a preacher and young William asked him, what should I do? And the preacher told him, he said, when you start your work, when you earn your first dollar, give 10% of what you've earned to the church and continue to do so all your life and God will bless you. Now William Colgate started as an apprentice in the soap factory eventually worked his way up and became a manager and became the owner and eventually founded the company that we know today, Colgate. And at his end of his life, Sir William Colgate donated 90% of his income to churches, to charities, to kingdom advancing institutions and he lived with only 10% of his income. You see, William Colgate developed a mindset, a culture within his heart of abundance. He recognized one thing. He said, if I only take 10% of what God is giving me, then I am not the limiting factor in whatever business venture I'm doing. Then God can bless me super abundantly because the 10% that I can live off would be much more than 90% or 100% if I control everything. He developed a culture in his heart of abundance because that's heaven's culture, one of generosity and abundance. There's no limit to what God can get to us, somebody once said. There's no limit to what God can get to us if He knows that He can get it through us. You and I are like conduits. Conduits to channel the blessing of God into our world. The 
problem is those conduits get blocked. And when that conduit begins to exist for itself, then it stops God. It disallows God from pouring more into it because it's already full of itself. And I believe the Holy Spirit is anointing our heads to think different thoughts so, so that we will overflow once again, so that we will conduit and channel the goodness of God, the blessings of God to those around us. I always tell my kids, I said, listen, the world consists out of givers and grabbers. Which one are you? Think about this. The world consists out of two kinds of people, givers and grabbers. Grabbers have a poverty mentality, have a mindset of lack. And if my mindset is that of poverty, done with the then I have to grab whatever I can get to look after myself. But when I have a culture in my heart of abundance, and I know my Father will provide all my needs, then I can live with open hearts and open hands and be generous. Think about this. What is your money culture? Because every heart and every home has a money culture. Does your money culture align with that of our Father in heaven? Or maybe you have a money culture that's still dipped in poverty. I remember when we got married many years ago. It feels like many years ago. You know, we had two different money cultures. I came from a very poor middle class family. But one thing I want to honor my, my parents for is they never attached shame to money. And for many people, shame is connected to money. Whenever I remember dealing with some, some of my colleagues, and the moment you talk about money, the one girl began to cry. And it wasn't even a major issue, but she had such a lot of shame connected to money that it was a, a point of pain for her. But, but I honor my parents because they taught us to talk about money openly and attach no emotion to it. In other words, don't give money that place of honor in our lives. When Katinka and I got married, she came from a different family with a different money culture. And in the, in the initial 10 years, we, we had a lot of conflict when it comes to finances. Reason being, we had two money con cultures coming into conflict in marriage. And, and many folk and many couples that we counsel experience the same problem. But what is your money culture in your heart, in your home? And I believe we're in a season where the Holy Spirit is challenging us. Would you align the culture of your heart and of your home to heaven's culture? Because heaven's culture is one of abundance. In the Father's house, there, there's many mansions. In the Father's house, there is enough for everyone. In the Father's house, we don't have to be grabbers. We can be givers because that is what He is. He's generous and He's giving in nature. Why do some siblings that grow up in a poor home rise above poverty and break into abundance and others who grow up in the same home stay in poverty? Why do some siblings who grow up in a rich home, in an affluent home, take that affluence to another level and yet others squander everything they have and end up poor? It's about the culture we develop in our minds and our hearts. Some wealthy man once said, if, if I give my children everything that I've built, all the wealth, all the riches that I've built in my lifetime, yet do not give them the knowledge and the wisdom that I've accumulated, they will squander what I give them. You see, God as a father to whom hath the cattle on a thousand hills belong wants to give us whatever he has, but he knows he can't give it to us because we will probably squander it because we don't have his same mindset and his same culture. And so if we want this covenant of abundance, if we want to enter and live in this abundance, we have to change the culture of our hearts and our minds and our homes to align with heaven's culture. So what is your money culture? I want to remind you of the good news, and that is that your head is actually anointed to overflow. And maybe we can say that. Maybe if you're watching on the screen, you can say that with us. Say, my head is anointed to overflow. I am anointed to think thoughts of abundance. That's what the shepherd does. And I pray that he would anoint you even this morning as you listen to this service. That he will anoint your heads to begin to think the thoughts of heaven. To begin to think the thoughts of your father. That there is more than enough. Jesus says you can't serve both God and money. You can't submit to money and God simultaneously. How do we submit to money? I remember... 
when uh, my my spiritual mentor that led me to the Lord initially, um, when, when, when he invited me to go on a mission trip with him, I said, well, if the money is there, I will go. And it was a couple of weeks, well, one week before I had to pay my, my fare. He asked me, did you have the money? And I had nothing. And I again said to him, well, if the money is there, I'll go. And he said, no, I want you to go and pray and get an answer from the Lord. And when I prayed, the Lord revealed this to me. He said, you will not go on this mission trip because money is your God. And I said, Lord, how, how is money my God? And he said to me, you are allowing money to dictate whether you will go on this mission trip or not. He's saying, if money allows me to go, I will go. So I said, Father, what do you want me to do? And this is what he said, Uncle Tace. He said, you make up your mind today that I want you to go on this mission trip and money will follow you. You see, when we say, if money allows me to do this, I will do it. Then money is actually dictating. So money is my Lord. Money is my master. I can't serve God if money doesn't allow. And then God taught me, he said, no, you, you first make up your mind that God wants me to go on this seminar or God wants me to go on this mission trip or God wants me to do this thing and money will always follow. But we have to develop the culture of our Father in terms of dealing with those issues. How, how do we live in this covenant of abundance? We need to build this culture of overflow into our life. Again, I want to ask you this question. How does your money culture look like? God is really interested in how we deal with money. That's why there's over 3,000 scriptures in the Bible dealing with wealth and riches and money. Why is it that God is so interested in money? I believe it's because our hearts are located where our treasure is. Remember what Jesus said. He said, now where your treasure is, there your heart will be. I call it the heart-wallet connection. You touch my wallet, you touch my heart. The quickest way to, to see where somebody's heart is is to put your hand on his wallet. Okay? And somebody explained it like this. He calls it the T-Rex Christians. You know what a T-Rex dinosaur is? It's a big body with the short arms. The moment the pastor starts taking up the offering, everybody's arms are too short to reach into their pockets. They just go like this. You see, because your heart and your wallet is connected to one another. Luckily, we've already taken up the offering. And if you're watching over the internet, you're free to give it your own time and your own leisure. So we're not trying to milk offering today. But it's important that we, that we preach and we teach on heaven's culture when it comes to abundance. I know there's been much abuse when it comes to finances in, in the broader church. And maybe for some time, it's caused the church to be too silent about money matters and about the things of finances and wealth. But we have a responsibility to teach the Bible, to preach what the Bible says about wealth and the principles, or else we won't be blessed. If we keep on doing what we've, what we've done up to now, we're going to get the same results. But if we can align ourselves to our Father's principles and our Father's culture, then we can expect a change to come, also in the area of wealth. I've learned one thing, and that is that money has never changed somebody for the, for the better. Have you, have you ever noted that? A sudden influx of money has never changed somebody for the good. In fact, 9 out of 10 people who win the lottery in 6 months afterwards, after they won the lottery, is either bankrupt or dead. That's statistics. Their family members would kill them for the money, or they end up bankrupt because they overspend. You see, a sudden influx of money that we didn't work for, that we weren't prepared for, can actually destroy our lives. If we don't develop heaven's culture and heaven's mindset in terms of dealing and stewarding our finances. Maybe that's one of the reasons why many of us are still not at the place where we feel we have a breakthrough in terms of finances and wealth. Because we haven't upgraded our thinking. And so that's why I'm so excited about this wealth creation seminar and series coming up over the next few weeks because it will really equip and empower us to think heaven's thoughts on in the area of money and wealth and finances have you ever found that you get a raise in salary or in income just to discover a couple of months later you're in the exact same position financially than you when you were before you got a raise <laughs> the problem was i didn't need a raise in income or salary as much as i needed a raise in my thinking I needed to up the level of my culture in terms of aligning to heaven's culture. Getting more money is not always the answer. 
In fact, if you get more money, if you get a raise in salary but not a raise in thinking, you'll find a way to squander. Why? Because I get a 5,000 rand maybe increase and then I just accrue more debt against that increase and I'm a bigger slave than I was before I got the increase. So I haven't developed heaven's culture of abundance and upgraded my thinking. And so we are called to manifest the goodness of God on the face of the earth. How, how do we live in this covenant of abundance? David says this, he says, You anoint my head and therefore my cup overflows. You, you anoint my head for abundance. And then he says something important. He says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. If we want to live in this covenant of abundance and we need to learn to attract the goodness of God into our lives. Thais, I, I know a few people that whatever happens in their lives, they always see the good in the situation. However bad the circumstances are, however bad they are treated by people, they will always look at something good about this, that, that person or, or the situation. And I find that people who focus on the goodness of God in the midst of even bad situations ultimately experience good. Ultimately, good comes out of the situation for them. I also find some other people find the bad in any possible situation. We've got the saying that some people find problems for every single solution you offer them. It's called a pessimist. We'd invite them to a church seminar, to a men's breakfast and say, brother, would you come? He says, no, I can't come. I don't have money. I say, no, don't worry. I'll sponsor you. No, but I don't have time. I have to watch all the series on TV over the weekend probably or something. You, you give them all the solutions, and, but they would just find a problem for every possible solution. And God is calling us to, to learn to attract His goodness. How? By focusing on the good stuff in life. Focusing on the good God can make work together in every situation. Why is the goodness of God so important? Because the very nature of God is that He's good. You know, when God created the heavens and the earth, after one day of creating, Uncle Frank, he stood back and he said, wow, this is good. And he did that for a number of days. And then he created man as the, in the image and likeness of God as the crown of creation. And when he again looked back at, at man standing in the context of creation, God this time did not say it is good, but he said, this is now very good. And the word very means abundantly good extremely good and fanatically good. Have you ever considered that when God made you, He thought of you as the most extreme expression of His goodness on the face of the earth. That you are the most fanatic expression of our Father's goodness on the earth. That you and I were called to manifest the abundance of God on earth. As it is in heaven, so it be on earth. We need to change our culture, isn't it? We need to change the way we think about this. We need to learn to attract the goodness of God. I tell the story about the pessimist and the optimist. Maybe you've heard it before. But the, the pessimist arrives home. And his mom tells him, she says, Listen, you have to go and look in your room. This is a surprise for you. And he opens the room door. And there's gift boxes all the way to the ceiling. As he opens the door, it falls into the hallway. And he staggers back. And the pessimist goes and he says, Ach, near. Now I have to open all of this. His brother, the optimist, arrives home a little bit later and his mom again says to him, listen, there's a surprise in your room. You better go and look. He opens the door and again, this time it's not gift boxes, but it's horse manure all the way to the ceiling and he opens the door and all of it falls out. He runs to the garage and grabs a shovel and starts digging in his room. And after a while, his head surfaces and he says, wow, with all these horse manure, there must be a horse in here. You see, we need to learn to attract the goodness of our Father. And when we focus on the goodness of God, when we put lenses on that says, I'm going to look for the good of God. I want to see how my Father is going to work all these things together for my good because I'm called according to His purpose and I'm called to His love. If we have that mindset, that focus, guess what we're going to experience? The goodness of God. We're going to find a horse in the middle of all that manure. We're not going to find excuses for every solution, but we're going to find the goodness of God. 
Moses had a revelation of the goodness of God. And I want to share this with you in Exodus 33 from verse 15. And read with me. It says, Then Moses said to God, He said, This is now after Moses started negotiating for the presence of God to accompany Israel. Moses says this, But if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Because how will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you've asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. Moses says, Lord, we cannot go into the promised land if you don't go with us. You can give us the promises. God says, I'll give you the promises, but I'm so fed up with Israel. I'll give you the promises, but not the presence, not my person, not my presence. You, you have it without me. Sometimes as parents, we feel like that. Have you ever noted as a parent, you buy your children gifts or you buy them sweets before that they're happy in the car you give buy them gifts the next moment they're fighting over it in the car you want to take it back or you want to leave them in the car and get out and walk home i think god felt like that sometimes because of israel's complaining moses says listen god we can't go without you we want the promised land but not without you not without your presence and then god said okay we'll go with him and it says then moses realized he had favor with god in the moment Moses realized he had favor with God, listen to what he asked in verse 18. Then Moses said, Now Lord, show me your glory. Now no man has asked to see God's glory before that point in time and live to tell the story. Because if you see God's glory, you will die. But Moses found favor and he ventured out and he said, Lord, show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God said to Moses, Moses, I can't show you my face because you will die. But what I'll do is I'll declare my glory to you. And my glory is all about my goodness, and my kindness, and my love, and my mercy. You see, the goodness of God is the glory of God. And Moses has this revelation that God is good. Even in the Old Testament, under the, the regime of judgment, if I would, God was always about goodness. God was always about mercy and kindness and love. And you and I need a revelation of the goodness of God. If we want to live in a culture of abundance, if we want to live in this covenant of abundance, we need to have a revelation of the goodness of God. Maybe we need to put up lenses of our spiritual eyes to, to seek out the goodness of God. Lord, in every circumstance, good must come out of it. Be it a COVID-19 lockdown, goodness must come out of it. You have a, the a divine ability, the sovereign ability and commitment to make all things work together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. And so Moses has this revelation. Whatever we focus on, we will attract into our lives. And if you and I are like the pessimist and we always think of the negative things in life, guess what we will attract into our lives? We will attract negative things into our life. If you and I are focusing on the goodness of God and the abundance of God and the blessings of our God, guess what we will attract into our lives? The overflow of God. Somebody once illustrated, a good friend of mine, Dr. John Tabani, illustrated it like this. He says, success has eyes and ears. And, and if you look at somebody who is successful and you criticize his success because you're jealous of his or her success, then success comes and they hear and then they said, wow, we better steer, stay clear of this one because he's against us. But if you celebrate and honor the success and rejoice in the success of someone else and success comes and he listens and he sees that you are happy with somebody else's success, success then success says i want to camp set up camp here by this one because he celebrates us you see whatever you and i celebrate whatever we focus on we will attract into our life i want to attract more of the goodness of god in my life i don't know about you how do we do that learn to celebrate the goodness of god learn to seek the goodness of god in every situation david He's teaching us this. David learned how to attract the goodness of God. David did not have a perfect life. I think like most of us, David had his real life. 
And real life is full of pains and problems. But David had a re- and in the midst of all that reality, David wrote this many times about the goodness of God. But he made this statement. He said, I would have despaired if I did not believe. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In the midst of all the pain, in the midst of all the troubles, David said, I'm, I'm seeking the goodness of God. I'm learning to attract the goodness of God into my reality. Paul had the same. The same Paul who wrote and, and, and said to us, we know God works all things together for our good. You know where Paul wrote that? It was in a prison cell. It was in bondage. It was in a terrible situation. But Paul saw the goodness of God even in the midst of his greatest trials. And so if we can learn to attract the goodness of God in our lives, we do well. And the final thought I want to leave with you is this, that we need to stay in the flow of God's mercy. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. The book of Revelation talks about this river flowing from the throne of God, the throne of mercy, past the cross of mercy. And then it explains how trees would grow on the banks of these rivers and the leaves of that tree would be of the, for the healing of the nations. Can you imagine that just a leaf growing on a tree that's growing adjacent to the river of mercy is so powerful that a single leaf can heal nations? You see, the river of God's mercy is such a powerful force. And whenever you and I choose to forgive someone, choose to release mercy instead of judgment, guess what happens? We release the supernatural power of heaven's mercy into a situation. There's a direct connection between abundance and forgiveness. One of the quickest ways that you and I can have our finances dry up is to have unforgiveness, bitterness, and resentment in our hearts. Katinka and I have learned this a long time ago, that we cannot afford to keep a grudge. We cannot afford to become resentful against people. Because if we do that, we block the flow, the supernatural flow of heaven's mercy into our lives. Somebody once made the statement and said that forgiveness is the retaliation of the cross. Think about this. Forgiveness was God's way of retaliating against man's sin. He unleashed heaven's mercy upon mankind who did not deserve it. We don't forgive people when they deserve it or because they forgive deserve it. We, we, we forgive people because we deserve to live a life of abundance. You see, heaven's got an abundant supply of mercy. The Bible says that His mercies are new every morning. And that's why Jesus, when Peter asked Him, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive this brother? You see, Peter was his sins from Donner geweest. He was a son of thunder. He was an angry man, actually. And Peter turned to Jesus and said, how many times do I need to forgive this brother? I think his brother, I don't know if it was James or Andrew, which one of them, but one of these brothers really offended him again, maybe doing the same thing again and again and again. And Peter goes like, here I was a cop of club. <laughs> and Jesus says, how many? 70 times? Seven. 490 times, Peter, a day. Why? How can Jesus say that? 490 times a day you must forgive him because my mercies are new every morning. Heaven will never have a lack of mercy. Heaven will never run out of a supply of mercy unless we block our hearts and we become hardened in our hearts and resentful. But when we do that, we're not only blocking the mercy of God, we're also blocking the provision of God. I need a volunteer. Three volunteers actually. Andre, can I use you? But just wear your mask if you come forward. Please come, Andre. And then I'm going to use Beryl and Charmaine because you the two of you are, are beautiful. Mercy and goodness. And, and you, you'd be you. You'd be Andre. Can I use Andre in the illustration? Okay. Come girls onto the stage on that side. So let's say Charmaine represents the goodness of God. Is that correct? And Beryl represents the mercy of God. Okay. Andre, you are called to follow the shepherd. I'm the shepherd now. Okay. You want goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life. Okay. He wants that. So, for the first illustration, you mustn't follow me. You must just go your own way. Goodness and mercy are assigned to follow the shepherd. Wherever the shepherd leads, they will follow. So I'm going to walk one way, and you walk another way, and the two of you must follow the shepherd. Is that right? 
Okay, here we go. So Andre really wants the goodness of God and the mercy of God, but he goes his own way, and guess what's going to happen? He's going to live a life that's frustrating because he's always missing the goodness of God. Maybe he crosses paths with goodness and mercy accidentally and experiences the goodness of God momentarily, but he will not live a life of constantly being chased down, run down by the goodness and mercy of God. Now Andre comes... And he repents and he turns not only to Jesus as shepherd but also Lord. And he gives his life to Jesus and he begins to follow the shepherd. No, no full him. Eh? And as he follows the shepherd and he learns that the shepherd provides for him, restores him, gives him purpose, victory, breakthrough and all these things. Guess what happens to Andre? The goodness and the mercy of God chases him down all the days of my life, David writes. Isn't that amazing? When we focus on the shepherd, when we follow the shepherd, our portion will be goodness and mercy.
Perishable food at our office to help those in need. Catch this week's City Kids video episode on our Facebook page. Thank you for remaining faithful with your financial contributions. I want to invite you to join our next midweek series on wealth creation. A few years ago I had a dream and in that dream the church at which we were pastoring at the time was being robbed and when I confronted the robbers in my dream they said why do you have a problem with us robbing God's people if they leave doors open that's the myth. I woke up in a cold sweat and heard God saying to me that it's true that his people are being robbed and that his desire is to give them abundant life and then he wants to use me to equip his people uh, to, to build wealth and so we went on a holiday and I felt the Lord led me to study from Genesis to Revelation. And as I did, I believe a blueprint for abundant life, the wealth plan of God just started to come into place and clear, clear to me. And I realized that God's very much uh, interested in how you and I deal with money. There's over 2,000 scriptures in the Bible about money and wealth. And so God's heart is really to bless you and I until we become a blessing to other people. But how can we be the light of the world? If we struggle sometimes to pay our own water and life account. And so each of us currently holds the capacity to steward wealth. And if your capacity, for instance, is 30,000 Rand, and I give you 10,000 Rand, you're going to find a way to increase that 10,000 to 50,000. You see, that's your capacity. If somebody were to give you 10 million Rand, you're going to find a way to reduce that 10 million back to 50,000, because again, that is your capacity to steward. And so if you and I want to steward the wealth that God wants to entrust to us, we have to upgrade our thinking, we have to upgrade our capacity. Many years ago, scientists they did an experiment where they placed fleas in a container and lit them at 30 centimeters. You know, see, flies can jump about, or fleas can jump about one meter high. And so what these fleas started doing is, to avoid the risk of injuries, they started jumping 29 centimeters. After a while, the scientists removed the lid and found the fleas to continually jump in 29 centimeters because by now they had conditioned their mindset to operate far below their potential to avoid the risk of injury. And the same happens to you and I. We go through life, we hit a few bumps in the road, and we, we, we formulate in our mind, we condition ourselves to avoid injury, and we operate far below our potential. And I believe this this series, this, this wealth creation series and book is designed by God to help you and I break through our limitations so that we can fulfill our full potential. I once told this story to a friend when I asked him when he's going to buy his first property. And at the time he, he instinctively answered me, he said, on a salary of a youth pastor, I would never be able to afford owning my own house. I will be a lifelong tenant. I told him the story about the fleas. I challenged, challenged his mindset and find him a few months later looking for his own property. Within 18 months, he had acquired two properties that gave him about five or six rental units that paid for the property itself. And his words to me was, he said, Jan, that evening after our conversation, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I just saw fleas jumping up and down in my mind. And that's my prayer, that this course would really do that for you, that this series would do that for you, that the Holy Spirit fleas would start jumping up in your mind to... to to, to remind you not to live below your potential. So join us for this. The series is free of charge, so you can just watch online, we'll register you, and send you the weekly links for the sessions. But we do encourage you to buy the books, they're 200 rand a piece, and the reason being is 
the, the books offer real sound practical applications of, for every session so that you can not only hear this word but apply it to your life and it might transform your life and build your, your capacity to steward what God wants to entrust to you. God bless you and I hope you join us.